Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Sarah Hollitz at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk today. And today I'm gonna to be presenting some of the work from the Warman Lab, um, investigating the biological differences between Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy. I'd like to begin by providing a little bit of a background on prion diseases for those who aren't as familiar with them. They're neurodegenerative disorders that are genetic, sporadic, or acquired diseases that are caused by protein misfolding and aggregation in the brain. And so how this process works is the cellular form of PRPC, the prion protein, is high in alpha helices and it can misfold into a stacked sheet structure. And then this misfolded structure can then pile on top of each other to form a fiber or an aggregate that can then deposit in the brain. And what you're seeing here is a neuropath image um, that's an example of very creutzfeldt jakob disease. And so there's many uh, prion diseases and some of the classical examples would be BSC or what is commonly known as mad cow disease, creutzfeldt jakob disease, Kuru, scrapie in sheep and goats, transmissible mink encephalopathy, and chronic wasting disease in deer and elk. And some people may wonder, you know, how does the misfolding of one protein cause so many different diseases, right? Even in humans, we have creutzfeldt jakob disease and Kuru. And we think that the prion disease diversity arises from unique strains or conformations of misfolded PRPSC or PRP scrapie. And we can think about the different strains as different shapes um, as seen in this figure. So at the top, we have one strain that's represented by the pink squares. And as we move over to the right, we can see that this strain causes unique neuropathology in the brain of a host, as well as a unique biochemical signature when we do other tests in the laboratory to look at how the protein degrades. Whereas strain two, represented by the blue diamonds, again, has a different neuropathology and a different biochemical signature when we move into the laboratory diagnostics. So a big question recently in the field is, are distinct alpha-synuclein strains the underlying cause of synucleinopathies? And in the Warman lab, we think that yes, this is the underlying cause of um, the unique diseases. And we think that this occurs by the cellular alpha-synuclein in the brain misfolding again into that stacked beta sheet structure that can form a fibril and aggregate and then deposit in multiple system atrophy as glial cytoplasmic inclusions that are seen here or Lewy bodies that are seen in Parkinson's disease. And we already have some data suggesting that these two diseases are differentiable um, in patients. And these um, include the incidence of disease. Parkinson's is more common than multiple system atrophy. The age of onset differs between the two diseases uh, with Parkinson's disease patients typically being diagnosed later in life. And the mean survival also differs. Parkinson's disease patients can live up to two decades when they have supportive care. A little bit more background um, on multiple system atrophy or MSA as I'll likely refer to it throughout the rest of this talk. It's a rare neurodegenerative disease that affects the autonomic nervous system. There's no known causative mutations that lead to the development of this disease. As I previously mentioned, patients are typically diagnosed in their 50s to 60s and live six to 10 years after their diagnosis. Symptoms can include orthostatic hypotension, vocal cord paralysis, difficulty regulating their body temperature, poor balance and uncoordinated movement. And up to 30% of patients also suffer from cognitive impairment. But one thing to really note about patients suffering from MSA and why um, our research is so important is that many of these patients are fully cognitively aware that their body is failing them throughout the course of the disease. And this is why it's so important for us that we do this basic research and understanding strains so that in the future, we can hopefully develop therapeutics. Unfortunately, a definitive diagnosis for MSA can only be made at autopsy by the presence of the glial cytoplasmic inclusions. 
throughout my talk, you'll see MSA shown as this purple triangle or just simply the color purple. On the other hand, Parkinson's disease is a progressive nervous system disorder that affects movement. And unlike MSA, there are multiple genetic mutations that have been identified in patients that are linked to the development of PD. And patients are diagnosed later in life and can live up to two decades, as I noted earlier. And the symptoms include the common resting tremor that's characteristic of PD, slowed movement, rigid muscles, and difficulty with their speech and writing. Again, unfortunately, a definitive diagnosis can only be made at autopsy by the presence of Lewy bodies in the brain. And this green pentagon will denote Parkinson's disease or just the green color as well. So to begin, what makes PD and MSA unique strains? So there's a few properties that I listed out in this table that you see here. Unique clinical data is the first set of properties that we look at. Um, in MSA and PD, one has identified mutations, one does not. Um, MSA attacks the autonomic nervous system while PD primarily affects movement. And we also have neuropathological data for, from patients. GCIs or the glial cytoplasmic inclusions are the hallmark of MSA, whereas Lewy bodies are the hallmark of PD. So I also have animal models listed here, infections in a cell model, and also the structure of the misfolded protein itself. And right now, these are blank. Um, throughout this talk, I'll be presenting some data to you and start filling in these blanks in the table as we go. Okay. So back in 2013, work in the Prusner lab started focusing on thinking about multiple system atrophy as a prion disease and investigating if it acts similarly. And so to begin these experiments, they were using a transgenic mouse model that expresses human alpha synuclein with one of the Parkinson's disease mutations, which is A53T. So whenever you see M83 mice, think of the A53T mutation throughout this talk. And so the mice that have two copies of this gene develop uh, spontaneous disease, which is why for all of the studies I'm going to talk about today, they use a hemizygous mouse model, which means there's only one copy of this mutation. And using this animal model, when we take brain sample from two MSA patients, we can actually transmit MSA to these mice, suggesting that similar to prion diseases, you can get transmission of disease from one uh, host to another, suggesting a prion-like mechanism. And they expanded this study then to 14 MSA patient samples, which all transmitted neurological disease to these mice in about 120 days. But on the other hand, when they repeated the same experiment with six Parkinson's disease samples, none of the mice um, became clinically ill. Uh, and this was out past 540 days. So this is a really long time. And further, when they went to look at the brain pathology in these mice, what they found was that when they have their control samples used um, as their injected material, it doesn't cause any neuropathology in the brain, which you can see here on the left with the absence of the phosphorylated alpha synuclein. With the two MSA cases, there is deposition of phosphorylated alpha synuclein in the brain and also abundant gliosis as well. But when we look on the right at the two cases of Parkinson's disease that were tested, there's very, very little staining for phospho-alpha synuclein, and there's no detectable gliosis, suggesting that there is strain-specific behavior of MSA and PD in this mouse model, and that we can use this mouse model to study MSA, but we can't use it to study PD. So going back to our table, we now have an animal model that we can use um, to study MSA moving forward. But animal models take a really long time sometimes to get data at the end of the at the end of the assay. 
So Dr. Warman and her colleagues wanted to develop an assay where we could get data much more quickly within a week and use this to study strain behavior. And to do this, they developed a cellular assay using human embryonic kidney cells, uh, which you can see right here in this little picture. And what they did was engineered the cell line to express human alpha cytonuclein with that same Parkinson's disease mutation, which can be seen in this construct up here. They then fused this to yellow fluorescent protein, which is how the cells then fluoresce. And then once the cell line was engineered, we can now use it uh, to plate in a 384 well plate in the laboratory. We let the cells grow and stick onto the bottom of the plate. We can isolate our prions from human or mouse brain samples. And then we can take those alpha synuclein prions and infect those cells and let them incubate and grow for four days. And what we get at the end of that assay is a picture that looks like this down in the right hand corner, where we see these fluorescent puncta, which are the aggregates of misfolded alpha synuclein. And this is our readout that suggests that there's infection from any sample that we started with. And so using this cellular assay, we uh, first looked at MSA and Parkinson's disease. And similar to the mouse data, when you use a control sample, you don't get any infection in the cell model as expected. And with Parkinson's disease, again, just like it couldn't infect the mouse model, Parkinson's disease can't infect these cells either, which you can see over here quantified in the graph. But when we look at the four cases of MSA that were used as the source of the alpha synuclein prions, there was significant infection. And you can also see that here in the MSA samples in the graph. So now we have a mouse model where we can study MSA and that PD doesn't propagate in. And we also have a cell line where MSA propagates and PD doesn't. So, so far, this is adding on to our list of different criteria for MSA and PD where both strains act differently. The next step in characterizing MSA as a unique strain was expanding this to look at primary transmission and look at cell infection within the same experimental setup. So after they took the patient sample and tested this on cells, which can be seen in the first green box, there was cellular infection from the MSA sample. Then there was primary transmission into mice. And you can see again, all of the mice got sick in around 120 days. And then interestingly, when we take those brains from the mice, isolate our prions, and then infect our cells again, we see similar levels of infection. So this suggests that MSA retains its strain properties through multiple passaging paradigms. We can then expand the use of this cellular assay to try to understand strain biology as a whole. So they engineered a panel of cell lines, right? So here is the original A53T cell line that I've shown you data from already, as well as a wild type alpha synuclein line. So this doesn't have any mutations. And then there's a variety of mutations, including A30P and E46K that are also found in Parkinson's disease patients. So using a panel of cell lines, we can look for infection by MSA and use this to create um, kind of a map of can MSA infect these cell lines? And if it does, does this tell, anything, tell us anything about the strain behavior? Okay. And so when we used MSA as our source of alpha synuclein or the mice that were infected with MSA as the source, what we found was that these samples could infect the wild type cells. They could also infect cell lines that harbored the A30P mutation from Parkinson's disease. And they could infect cell lines that had a double mutation with A30P or A53T. But interestingly, 
when the cells expressed E46K, another Parkinson's mutation that I mentioned earlier, MSA could not infect the cell line. And even when we expressed A53T alongside E46K, this couldn't rescue um, infection by MSA. So this um, had everybody scratching their heads, wondering what was special about E46K that was making it so that MSA wasn't infectious and couldn't cause um, aggregates in our cell line. So they moved on to looking at the structure of the misfolded proteins themselves. In, in 2020, uh, Schweighauser and colleagues published the first cryo-EM structures uh, from MSA patient samples. And what they found was when they went to look, when they were thinking about the E46K mutation and how this could interrupt MSA infectivity, they isolated this salt bridge. And this salt bridge forms between a glutamic acid at residue 46 and a lysine at residue 80. And normally this salt bridge is happy and there in the MSA um, structure and in the wild type structure it can form. But when you have the mutation of glutamic acid to lysine, it blocks this salt bridge. So the formation of a salt bridge between two lysines can't happen because you get this repulsion that prevents that interaction. So the hypothesis became that this repulsion prevented any conversion from occurring between MSA and E46K alpha synuclein. And expanding on this hypothesis, they then looked at fibrils that were made in the laboratory that were either wild type or harbored any number of the PD mutations. And what they found was that they didn't exhibit similar biological activity to the human MSA prions. So here's the data that I've previously shown you where MSA material and material from the mice infected with MSA don't infect cells. But when we have the fibrils made in the laboratory, it, they all infect the cell lines um, across the board, even when there isn't a mutation. So this behavior, um, this behavior is not what would be expected when we see MSA, which also doesn't have mutations. And this is likely because recombinant alpha-synuclein fibrils adopt different misfolded conformations than the alpha-synuclein and MSA patient samples. So on the left in the blue and the green are a variety of uh, confirmations that have been reported for the lab-made alpha-synuclein fibrils. And in the pink is the fibril structure that was reported for the MSA patient sample. And you can see that they're very, very different. And so now we can so far complete our table. We also have a structure now for MSA. And up to this point, nobody's been able to solve the structure for Parkinson's disease. So hopefully in the next few years, somebody will be able to do that so we can improve our assays and understand more about these strain properties. And the latest set of experiments by Dr. Warman and her colleagues um, involved expanding on their cell assay data. So does the cell assay predict in vivo transmission of MSA prions? And they chose to study this using the M83 mouse model with the A53T mutation, a wild type mouse model or the M20 mice, so there's no mutations in alpha synuclein, and then the M47 mouse model, which has the E46 muta mutation. And remember that mutation blocks MSA. And what we found first, starting with the M47 mice, was that wild type fibrils could not cause disease in this mouse model, but E46K fibrils did cause clinical disease, as well as neuropathology in these mice, which can be seen in the bar graph on the right. And even though wild type fibrils did not cause disease, they do induce a small number of phosphorylated aggregates, which can be seen here in these neuropathology photos. So the green is the phosphorylated alpha-synuclein. You can see a small number of aggregates that were induced by the wild type fibrils, but they appeared more fibrillar compared to the morphology of the aggregates induced by E46K fibrils, which are more abundant and appear more globular. 
So again, this is suggestive of two different strains because there are two different neuropathological morphologies. And interestingly, MSA does not transmit neurological disease to M47 mice. So this follows the paradigm where E46K blocked infection in our cell model, and it also blocks infection in the mouse model as well. And when we take the brains from the mice that were infected with MSA and use them as the source for our cell assay, we also do not get any cellular infection. So these findings uh, show us that our cell model is a predictive tool for understanding the strain biology. So now moving on to the wild type mouse model, wild type fibrils can now cause disease efficiently in the mice, whereas E46K fibrils cannot cause disease. And this can also be seen in the neuropathology where there's no neuropathology from the E46K fibrils, but there is with the wild type fibrils. And this can be seen here in the neuropathological findings. When wild type fibrils are used as the injected material, there's abundant pathology that can be seen by the green labeling of phosphorylated alpha synuclein. And there's no pathology here when E46K fibrils are used. But this time when MSA was used as the source of alpha synuclein prions, what they found was that it indeed does transmit disease. Um, in a wild type human alpha synuclein mouse model. In all six cases of MSA that were used, transmitted disease to the mice. And this is the first time that MSA has ever been shown to induce neurological disease in mice expressing wild type human alpha synuclein. So this is very important for the field because MSA has no detectable, there's, it has no mutations tied to the disease. And now we also have a mouse model that has no expression of human mutations, and we are getting clinical disease. And again, they retain their strain properties after passaging in the wild type mice. When we take the brains of the mice that succumb to MSA, we do get cellular infection in our A53T cells as seen previously, as well as the wild type cells like we've seen before. And again, the E46K mutation still prevents that MSA infection. So this is just bolstering um, that the cellular assay can be used to be predictive of alpha synuclein strain biology. And as I presented earlier, the M83 mouse model has been commonly used to study MSA. And the neuropathology between the wild type M20 mice and the A53T mice are very similar. And this is shown here when you look at the neuropathology of the phosphorylated alpha synuclein between the two. So this suggests that MSA is behaving the same way in two separate mouse models. And so now we've grown our arsenal for studying MSA. We now have two mouse models that MSA transmits disease to, both through the A53T mutation and the wild type mice. And importantly, E46K blocks MSA transmission or infection when it's present in the mouse model as well as our cellular assays. So based on all of this data that I've shown you, we think that PD and MSA are the result of two distinct alpha synuclein strains. And this is depicted here, showing that both start as cellular monomer um, of regularly folded alpha synuclein, which can misfold into either our green pentagons here in Parkinson's disease or the purple triangles in MSA, which then go to deposit in the brain of patients as either Lewy bodies or glial cytoplasmic inclusions. Um, and with that, I would like to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Amanda Warman, who did a bunch of all of the work that I presented today, as well as her colleagues um, back in California in the Prusner lab and the collaborators I'd like to thank as well, and the current Warman lab members um, who are helping 
further all of our MSA research today, as well as our funding. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions.